I have three pieces of wisdom to bring to you today. Just before the sermon, we incorporated this thing called the contemporary word of wisdom in our last series, and I really like that, so I'm going to continue with that. And our contemporary word today is a poem by Rumi, um, and he has this to say. Come to me and I shall dance with you in the temples, on the beaches, through the crowded streets. Be you man or woman, plant or animal, slave or free. I shall show you the brilliant crystal fires shining within. I shall show you the beauty deep within your soul. I shall show you the path to heaven. Only dance and your illusions will blow in the wind. Dance and make joyous the love around you. Dance and your veils, which hide your light, shall swirl in a heap at your feet. That's what Rumi has to say. Let's hear a a more ancient word of wisdom. These two selections from Scripture this morning, and I would just ask that you listen in these for the Spirit's word to you and to this community in this time. This first reading is from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, just after the appearance of the risen Lord to Mary and the women at the tomb. John writes this. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw him. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As God has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And just a last reading, this is from the epistle, the first epistle to John, the first chapter, writes, We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the very creator of the universe and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with both the Creator and with Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. So I'm wondering how many of you did the extra credit assignment included in this week's Thursday email? One, two, okay. Definitely there will probably be a chance for a makeup for the rest of you, but this is just a great opportunity to remind you that we do not just send these communications because they're fun for us, although they are, um, but that sometimes we include little Easter eggs in there for you to find, so check that out. In this last week's Thursday email, in case you did not receive it or thought, I already know all that, we um, included in the description of our upcoming worship, that's for today, a link to a YouTube video. Okay, one more. Oh, okay. Oh, well, okay, fine. You all all pass. You all pass. Of the title track of the 1952 classic American musical, Singing in the Rain. Awesome. So you guys watched that. Did you get a little zing from that? I had fun. And I wanted you to see that video as a way to just get excited about this new series, which is a lot about dance. And you know, I was thinking about it, I can remember my dad singing that song when I was a kid. You know, he'd sit down at the piano, which he loved to do, and sort of have his own little jam session, singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling. But as I was watching the clip before, I, I always try to vet things before I send them out to you. And I was watching the clip, I had this funny realization, which is, I don't think I've ever actually seen this movie. Like, I grew up singing this song all the time just because my dad sang it, but none of that looked familiar to me. So I did not want to be accused of commending something to you that I myself had not participated in, so I thought, I better watch this ASAP. And thanks to the awesome power of technology, I simply said, singing in the rain, into my Roku remote. Um, (laughs) And it worked some amazing magic, and minutes later, I was watching the incredible and may I say, very handsome, Gene Kelly twirling around in the pouring rain. Incredible. You should check it out if you haven't already. Do you guys remember this? Do you remember this movie, right? So Gene Kelly plays Don Lockwood, 
a popular silent film star with humble roots. Aw. Swoon. Who <laughs> and Don Lockwood always plays opposite uh, the leading lady, Lena Lamont, played by Jean Hagen, whose vain and shallow personality grates on Lockwood, even though he must maintain the illusion that they are romantically involved off screen as well in order to increase publicity for their films. Now, this is like decades before People magazine, right? But um, we're, still, we're still fighting that battle. So Lockwood then, then uh, it, through a series of events which could really only happen on a Hollywood soundstage, right? Never in real life. Lockwood meets and falls in for chorus girl Kathy Selden, played by Debbie Reynolds. After their first kiss, Lockwood celebrates his joy in the street in front of her house by singing the title number, Singing in the Rain. I have to say, things are not all so easy going forward from that moment because Lockwood now has to balance these multiple identities. The public movie star titillating his fans with his on-screen romance with Lamont and the private Lockwood whose true love is Miss Selden. And then something very dramatic happens. Do you remember what it is? The arrival of talking pictures. Suddenly, the silent star and his on-screen sweetheart are thrust into this new and strange world where their voices are part of the act. And suffice to say, because I don't want to ruin it for you if you're going to go watch it, it changes everything for them. But here's the main point I want to make about that, other than that Gene Kelly is very handsome and you should watch the movie. It's a movie about a very disruptive and seismic development happening outside of the main character's control, which forces him to confront whether and how he will take a risk to bring his most authentic self forward for others to see. Okay? Which I think is exactly what the resurrection is for the disciples. So, I mean, think about it. Think about it if you're a disciple. What, what you signed up for in the beginning was following this healer and preacher around in the desert, like learning about God and doing some crowd management here and there. But then there are the threats and the plots and the trip to Jerusalem and the political leaders, which enrages theater, which enrages the authorities and the arrest and the trial and the execution and the tomb. And then there are these rumors of resurrection from some women in the, their, your midst. And things change. And you're, there you are, left with Jesus' message and a whole lot of uncertainty, right? This is not what the disciples signed up for and probably not what they were any good at either. They agreed to be silent students. But after the resurrection, we get this sense they're going to be called upon to be talking teachers. It's a really different setup. And actually, I got to say, I love that what they do in response to this is just like lock themselves in a room and mope about it for a while, right? Because that's probably what I would do. But then into that room, the resurrected Jesus comes and wishes them peace and shows them himself and breathes the spirit onto them. Interestingly, when we read about this in Scripture, sometimes it's translated that Jesus imparted upon them a holy kiss, a kiss which changes their fear and self-doubt into confidence and joy and sends them out into the street dancing. Now, I find it so striking to think about this as the whole narrative of the disciples' lives, right? To see how these bumbling, blundering, not particularly faithful, ragtag disciples of the gospel become the apostles of the church. They become the preachers and the missionaries and the evangelists and the martyrs and the authors who have shaped our faith now for two millennia. It seems that in moving through the crucible of Jesus' death and rising, they too find their voice. And they become the ones themselves who proclaim, as John 1 notes, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard and seen and looked at and touched concerning the word of life so that you may have fellowship with us. I love that. I love that the Spirit made it possible for them to step out and that through all these generations, 
they're still working on teaching us to do the same thing. I think there are two things about this that are really important to me for us right now. And the first is just simply a reminder. You hear it every year at this time. We are inheritors of this same faith and this same spirit that arrived to the disciples in their moment of need. Like a few thousand years ago, a black and white world where death always had the last word suddenly exploded with the technicolor revelation that there is more life than we thought. That's our story. And the people who grabbed hold of it were never the same again after they heard and saw it. They were stronger and bolder and kinder and wiser, and that's our promise, that God has us covered and that we need not be afraid anymore. The message of Easter is let it rain because nothing can stop us from dancing out the truth that love wins and the joy that justice prevails and the hope that God is alive. And this Easter season, as it always is, is meant to help us drink in that assurance, right, that we need not live in fear anymore. But I also want to say, it's okay if we do. If we are holed up in some room somewhere, like literally or figuratively, fearful and uncertain about what our future will be, if the news of the resurrection that has reached us in this moment only feels like a rumor and not yet like a real promise of new life, that's okay. Because Jesus can still come to us. I think that's part of the story too. That Jesus can still find us in our hiding places and gift to us that same spirit that can eventually lead us out of there. I think that's a promise in the story too. And I just want to encourage you to be on the lookout for that in the days to come. So that's one important thing. Let me tell you one other important thing. The second important point is that we have all also, well, I don't know if you've noticed, maybe you've read the news, been through kind of a catastrophic shift in the world recently. And we, as a result, are in this unique position to be transformed by this moment, just as the disciples were transformed by the catastrophic events around Jesus' death. Right? Things have changed out there, and things have changed in here, too. And we're about to reemerge in the world. Like, we're kind of going slow, but we're about to sort of come back. And I think that it's true that right now, a tiny window of opportunity is opening. And it's not going to be open for long. I think right now, we're at a place where we can meet the Spirit in a way that will change who we will be when we step over the threshold back to our lives and into the light again. Like, who are we going to be now is like the question du jour that keeps coming to mind. Who are we going to be now? It's a powerful but also a little bit of a delicate kind of inquiry. Are we going to be our old selves or are we going to be something a bit new? I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. I'm just naming this possibility, this moment in which we are, in a certain sense, being given a chance to choose and stop and seek God's blessing for a renewed existence and a renewed mission and a renewed faith. Now, maybe this moment means something different, depending on where you are and who you are. I can appreciate that. Maybe this is the moment for you that you want to really dig down and dredge up some gifts which have long been latent in you. Now, maybe it's time to push aside whatever is inhibiting you from being who you truly are, knowing that maybe it'll be a risk, but that, as we said, God's got us covered. Or maybe it's simply time that for you to say the truth that has been put into your heart or into your hands or into your life. Say it out loud and not be ashamed of it at all. I don't know what it looks like for you, but I'm just saying I think there's a window here to investigate that before we step out into our new mission. I'll tell you a little bit what it looks like for me, actually, at least so far as I can tell. I've been having this sense recently that there is a call for me to emerge from this time with more boldness. And that way I resonate with the disciples. Boldness to proclaim what I know to be true and just, even if it is uncomfortable for other people. As a perpetual people pleaser, that is not an easy task for me even to consider. 
But it's something that I have had come to sense that is within me and which I sense will be critical to this coming chapter of my life and also my ministry here in this church. So I'm taking Jesus' hand, man, and I am setting aside my self-consciousness. I just posted a video of myself doing a line dance on the Internet. (laughs) It's a brave new world. I'm setting that aside as practice for joining the work of truth that I really want to do and becoming the kind of apostle and evangelist that I want to be. So that's what I'm doing. I just want to ask here in this time as we're starting off this new journey, what are you doing? Right? It's Easter, friends. Jesus has come to us. Jesus has reached out to offer us the Spirit's kiss. I hope you can hear the music start to rise even now. Will you join the dance? That's my invitation to you for this time and this season together. I hope you accept it with grace, and I ask that God who created, redeemed, and sustained us always will bless these words. Amen.